Um, so open your Bibles to the book of Hebrews. We're finally going to get back into this. And um, All right. probably not Thanks even you guys for my notes for serving. We've got two possibilities here. One is I could go through my notes, regardless of whether you get anything out of it or not, just for the sake of finishing them. Or I can just go and until it's time to stop and stop talking when I'm done, which I'm not that good at, but sometimes it works. So Hebrews chapter 10 is where we're at. We're going to pick up at chapter 19. Um, I can't remember what I titled this because it probably, as usual, doesn't have a lot to do with the message. Persecution, social shaming, and stuff. Uh, we probably won't get that far. Um, but, uh, yeah, so I'm going to pray one more time over the scripture now. Father, we thank you for the word of God. Thank you for the stuff in here. Some of us actually, is, is, you could choke on this. This is powerful and, and convicting. Um, but I pray that in it you just enable us to see the big picture. Um, and really the overview of Hebrews is that Jesus is superior. Jesus is better. Jesus instituted a better system. You inaugurated a new um, covenant, Lord, and, and that everything is just superior to any human method or ideology, Lord. And so, God, we pray that you'd open eyes of our hearts to understand the things that are in your word. In Jesus' name, amen. So all through the book of Hebrews has been this theme uh, to the people he's writing to, which are the Hebrews. And it's to the Hebrews that he's been saying Jesus is superior. God has spoken many ways, many times previously, but in these last days he's spoken through his son. God has a message through Jesus that's superior. Um, where's Jared at? Jared Gable, are you in here? You just had cold water training, um, survival, and I saw where they tipped you. You showed me where they tipped you over in that cage, which is cockpit, you know, potentially in the water. Uh, did you have some rules for just getting out of that? Were there, what were they? Do you? Find a reference point. Take your hand to your reference point. Find an exit. Don't let go pull yourself through. Okay, find a reference point. I, somehow I knew that that would have to be in there because when you're upside down and everything's confusing, you've got to find a reference point. And, and here is a reference point for us, you guys. We're in a world that's offering so many confusing, conflicting ideologies and ways to make yourself better or to fix your problems. And it doesn't stop when you come to Jesus. And many people have come to Jesus and they're like, there it is. I, I found it. This is my hope. And then somewhere along the line, you realize that you're still living with that person known as yourself, and a lot of yourself hasn't, didn't disappear when you gave your life to Jesus. And so you start, if you're not careful, begin looking for a new reference point or an additional reference point, And that's going to create confusion and ultimately death. Now, in the middle of this passage, we're going to look at chapter 19 through 39, probably over a couple of weeks, but we'll see how far we get today. But in the middle of it, there's bookends on both sides of this that... that talk to us directly about how to walk out or live out our faith or live in response to what God's shown us. But in the middle of that is this statement. Look at chapter, uh, 19, or chapter 10, verse 26. For if we go on sinning deliberately after receiving the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins, but a fearful expectation of judgment and a fury of fire that will consume the adversaries. Anyone who set aside the law of Moses dies without mercy on the evidence of two or three witnesses. How much worse punishment do you think will be deserved by the one who has, and he lists three things, trampled underfoot the Son of God, one, profaned the blood of the covenant that has made it common, by which he was sanctified, and third, outraged the spirit of grace, which is a weird, almost an oxymoron because the spirit of grace you think would be absolutely con unconditionally gracious. But he seems to be saying here there's a capacity, there's a possibility to actually insult the spirit of grace. For we know him who said, vengeance is mine, I will repay. And again, the Lord will judge his people. And then this was part, I, I believe, of, of a great revival in American history under Jonathan Edwards, um, Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. But this statement is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of a living God. 
Now that's all almost terrifying, right? And, and when you look at this and you just begin with that word, if we go on sinning, um, can we have a little confession here? How many of you, since you got saved, have sinned? How many of you have sinned intentionally since you got saved? Not as many. Actually, probably everyone at some point, it's like running a red light. You, you consider it, you're approaching it, you see it's turning yellow, and you think, I could either slow down and stop and spill the soup in the back of the car, or I can accelerate through this, and you run the red light. It's an intentional running of the red light. Did you do it on accident? I mean, did you see it? Yes, I saw it, officer. Um, did you speed up? Yes, I did. Instead of going 55, I was going 70 when I went through that because I was trying to make it, right? But it's an intentional thing. And so what he's talking about here, though, is an intentional sin of a certain court uh, kind that I would call apostasy. It involves actually, um, and it's more than just a sin, it's not that one sin you committed or even that sin you committed again and again because most of us have, commit, have certain besetting sins that we struggle with. The people that Jerry works with as addicts, um, certainly, maybe not all of them, but many of them are believers who struggle with this and they know it's a sin and yet they fall into it again and again. Are they, uh, are they no longer subject to the grace of God? But the point here, I believe, if you look at the context, first of all, where is that written? Well, it's written in the middle of the book of Hebrews. What is the book of Hebrews talking about? The superiority of Jesus Christ and salvation in him and him alone. So in the, in the writer's mind, the prominent, one of the prominent sins that you could commit as a person that he's addressing here is the sin of underestimating the power of Jesus Christ. And in fact, not, not only underestimating it, in a sense he calls it trampling underfoot the body of Christ, despising it, and taking the blood of Jesus that actually saved me from my sins and saying, oh, that's good, but it's not enough. And we devalue it. And this is what he means by profaning, making less the blood of Christ by which you were bought. And so we can, we can get these philosophies. And, you know, it didn't just happen to the Hebrews. I believe it happens to us because every time you go online, you find a thousand reasons why salvation in Jesus Christ alone is inadequate because they're offering some solution to the problem that's besetting you, some life hack. And if we're not careful, we use Christianity, our relationship with Jesus Christ, almost as a set of monkey bars by which we find a safe thing so we can swing to the next safe thing, safe in quotes, and then the next thing and the next thing until we're so far away that we've lost our way completely. We've become disoriented and lost. What are the dangers when someone goes into the water, uh, like Jared was talking about, or even um, a, a fr another friend who went, his uh, tractor fell in, was disorientation. You don't know which way is up. And I'll tell you, the Word of God is the only way, it's the only reference point. The Word of God, for instance, it said, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. A framework. And God said he created them both male and female. Female, A framework, a point of reference from which we can actually look at the world and understand the world. And the world will say, oh, you're, you know, you're a hate speech or whatever because you say some things that the Bible says. We don't have to offend people necessarily, but we do need to speak the truth. And so sandwiched on either side of this passage, which is a, I have to say is a hard one for me to even teach on because I want to teach on grace. And this is about grace. And if you look at the context, it's completely about grace. And in fact, what it is, is he's addressing is the fact that they're abandoning grace for an old system that can never save them. And so coming into this over and over again, he talks about, for he appeared once for all in chapter 11. He died once. He's been offered once in chapter 11 again. And then in chapter 10, Jesus Christ, his body has been offered once for all. And then uh, when Christ had offered a single sacrifice for all time, he sat down. All of those things speak of completion of a once and done thing. In other words, what Jesus did on the cross for you 
completed your salvation completely. Later on in, in chapter 10, it says, For by a single offering, verse 14, he has perfected for all time. And then here he deals with that oxym or, or that, that incons- what seems to be inconsistent. He's de- he saved, perfected for all time those who are being sanctified. In other words, God's got a process in your life of, of getting you free, getting me free from sin. But this work was done once and for all at a point in history. There's a point where Jesus was alive and there's a point where he, was died, where he died. And in a nanosecond, he died. And that was the only time he died. He didn't revive to die again and then die again and die again a million billion times for every sin that was ever committed. He died once for every sin ever committed in your life, past, present, or future. Once for all time, you have to hold on to that. Now, if you lose that fact, then you begin to devalue Jesus Christ, and you devalue the work that he has done, and you begin dragging back into some old system to pull something, find something good in that dumpster worth reviving and revitalizing and adding to your faith. And this was a problem with the Hebrews. So when we look at apostasy, as he describes it here, it very much involves that attitude. That attitude led into, yes, many different kinds of sins, but it was because of an attitude of, the, of not treasuring, valuing Jesus Christ high enough. Uh, Warren Worsby says there are four things that could lead a person toward uh, this kind of sin that's described here. He says, first of all, drift through neglect. We simply, and this is, these are things that he addresses in the book of Hebrews, neglect. How can we, uh, you know, how can we survive or how, and if we neglect so great a salvation, is a phrase he uses, to neglect. You know, a marriage doesn't last when there's neglect. God intends for us as spouses to pour into each other, to give, to add. It's like a flywheel. You've got to keep adding momentum or it stops spinning you add to it and to neglect your salvation is to stop listening to the lord to stop going to the word but then it leads to doubt of god's word when you neglect when you're not reading the word guess who the strongest voice in your life is it's the one you're hearing the most that begins to move you even though you know the truth of the word if you're not in the word that neglect will cause you to begin doubting because the world is constantly shouting it's monstrous to you over and over again. And that neglect leads to doubt of God's word. And then that doubt of God's word, and again, this is all taken from Hebrews, leads to us a growing dull towards the word. That then when it is spoken, it, we're dull to it. It's like, it's like there's 40 layers out there and you can feel something, but not really much anymore. You begin to lose the sensitivity to the things of God. And then fourth, what he describes here, a deliberate sin and we begin to despise our spiritual heritage, the de- deconstruction of the church and of everything that was precious to you at one time. And he's going to describe these things on book, as bookends on either end of this, but let's begin with verse 19. And there's, there's, what, five things, one, two, three, four things in here. An amazing impetus, that is something that spurs us to act in these first verses, and then there's a reasonable response to that the grave danger, which we read, and then a wise remedy, which ends the chapter. So let's look at uh, the first part here in verse 19. Therefore, brothers, and we would say brothers and sisters because that's who he's addressing. Therefore, brothers and sisters, and remember, therefore, when it says therefore, you have to see what it's there for. It's there for a reason. He's saying Look, I just laid 10 chapters of stuff out in front of you. And therefore, he says, since we, and then he gives you two things that are are the response. Because of this, we respond in this way. Two things. Since we have confidence to enter the holy place by the blood of Jesus Christ, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain that is through his flesh, and two, since we have a great high priest over the house of God. In other words, he's saying, and remember, set this against this apostasy or this danger of falling away, there's two things that are security for us. There's two things that highly motivate us to action, and it's these two things. It's the confidence that we have to get in the presence of God, 
and it's that we have a high priest. We have someone representing us, a great high priest, as he described him. This is, this is the superior kind of high priest that not only did the work of ministering, serving us, he did the work of dying to make that stick. And so these two things that are motivational, they lead to a response, and that's how he says it here. Therefore, since we have, and what do we have? First of all, we have confidence or boldness. Because, you know, there's a native, I would say, boldness that we have as a child of God that's born into us. And then we can lose that as we stumble or struggle, or maybe even someone comes and says, you know, Paul says to the Galatians, who bewitched you? Someone can trick us away from the confidence that we have in Christ and say, oh, that's good, but let me give you some stuff to add to that, to supplement your faith. And, and it isn't scriptural. Peter tells you how to supplement it, but people say you need to supplement it by, you know, praying, you know, uh, I don't know, casting demons out of yourself or something, um, or search for what the demon is that haunts you and deal with that. You can, there's a lot of things you can get really sideways on, right? Um, and go get too deep into and take you off. But anyhow, listen, he says, since we have confidence. Since we have confidence, and what's the confidence to do? It's to enter, and to enter where? The holy places. The holy places. What were that? That was, what were that? That's good English. What were that? Um, What was the holy places? What were the holy places? Um, They were, you know, as you came into the temple, right? There's that court where the people met. You came in first through sacrifice, and then you could, the, where the priest worked, but there is a gathering place where the people worshipped and listened to God's word, and a lot of things happened in the court, the outer court. And there was a holy place where the offering, the prayers were offered before God. And then there was an inner court, the holy place of really a fellowship with God. But no one could go in there yet, just once a year. But when Jesus died, remember we just talked about that the veil, that thick, curtain was torn top to bottom and access was granted so what are the holy places that we have access to all of that we have access to worshiping god in a new and living way we have access to fellowship with brothers and sisters but also fellowship with god we have access to the community of the believers you are the body of christ he said and members particularly of that and we have bold confident access to that we have confident access to what else? Forgiveness. And we could name a hundred other things. Healing. All these are things that we have access to, the Bible says. And we have access with boldness, with confidence. Paul says that it's like a little kid walking up and saying, Abba, Daddy, to God. You have that relationship with God. And since you have this confidence to enter the holy places, how do we enter? By the blood of Jesus by the new and living way that he opened up for us through the curtain. And the curtain, he clarifies, was his body. In a sense, his body was torn so that we could pass through it to God the Father. And since we have a confidence, that should bring us a great confidence to step out and actually use that position that we have come into the place. And I wonder how many times that we neglect even that. And he's going to talk about that here in a second. But he says, we have confidence to enter the holy place by the blood of Jesus, by this new and living way that he opened for us. And then secondly, since we have a great high priest over the house of God, he's the one representing us. In in Timothy, Paul says he ever lives to make intercession for us. That's in Hebrews, sorry. Um, That there is one uh, Father, God, and one mediator between God and man, the man, Christ Jesus. Jesus is a mediator, as a high priest for us. And again, that should give us confidence. You don't have to come through Mary or through the saints. This alone is the one by which you can come to God. And that gives us confidence. So since those two things, we should respond to those, and that should even, not even, let's, let's don't talk about it even necessarily as a, as a, a must-do, but can do or get to do or have the ability to do because of those two things. And what are they? Then he lists five things here. And I'll probably stop on these. But don't get your hopes up. I may not. I'm just trying to make up my mind right now as I'm on the fly, but we'll see how we go. So he says, 
And since we have a great priest, high priest over the house of God, what should we do? How should we respond? Verse 22, let us draw near with a true heart. You know, you can have confidence and you can have the high priest, but fail to draw near. And God says, just draw near. Come close to me. Draw near to me and I'll draw near to you. I like that song, as I draw near, as I draw near. Reveal yourself. That's, I think Scott Cunningham did that. But it, it's, a, it's a song about drawing close to God. He says, what we should do then is let us draw near. This is a response. But listen how he says to draw near. Let us draw near with a true heart. Because, you know, you can draw near with a false heart. Who did that? Judas did that. He drew near to Jesus with a false heart. But how do you draw near with a true heart? Does that mean you've got to get everything straight before you arrive? Not at all. It means that with your brokenness and with your weakness and failure and inadequacy and sense of inadequacy, you can confidently step into the presence of God. You can draw near to him with the true heart by being honest before him. David did that when after this sin with Bathsheba and the murder of her husband, he said, create in me a clean heart, O God. Renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence. Take not your Holy Spirit from me. Restore unto me the joy of my salvation. It was a cry from the heart. That's a true heart, a broken heart, a true heart. He says, let's draw near with that kind of heart. This is a natural response to this fact that we can confidently come into the presence of God, that God's given us a high priest who's standing there always interceding for us. And we can draw near with a true heart. And it's a true heart, and in that, there's a full assurance that I'm not having to hide anything. I can just come to him with who I am, with the full assurance of faith. And the faith is that God loves me, God's got this, God's at work in me to will and do it for his good pleasure. He's, we come with the full assurance of faith, and there's, he gives, what, four things here, I think, that we come with. Let us draw near with a true heart. Let us draw near in full assurance of faith. Let us draw near with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience. It's actually talking about a different aspect of the heart, the conscience that gets defiled by the stuff we do and the guilt that we feel. And he said the sprinkling is almost like a physical, uh, something you can see in a sense in, in, the, in the offerings before where you could see and you could say God's dealt with that. I feel defiled, I feel ugly, but God's dealt with that. So let us draw near true heart, full assurance, sprinkled clean from an evil, our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience, and our bodies washed with pure water. When you came into the temple, there was a big, they called it a bath, or a big thing where people, you could wash, the priests could clean themselves so they could do the work with clean, cleanness. Jesus, in a sense, did that when he washed the disciples' feet, feet, feet. So just checking to see if you're following me. Use, then throwing in some bad grammar, see if anyone raises an eyebrow. He, he washed their feet, and Peter said, okay, I want the whole bath then, because Peter said, no, you can't do this. And Jesus said, if I don't, you, don't, you know, have no part with me. And Peter said, well, how, give me the whole Monty. I, I want a bath too. This, let's just do this thing. And, and Jesus is like, no, Peter, you're already clean, but I'm going to wash your feet. And God wants us to come and, and let, us, let him serve us. Isn't that a beautiful thing about coming into the presence of God, drawing near to him, that he actually washes our feet in the process. He washes our bodies. He makes us clean again. Even though we're born again, we need to keep allowing him to wash us with this pure water. And then, so that that's the first thing, draw near. Second thing is let us hold fast the confession of our hope. Hold fast to this without wavering. What do you believe? The confession of your hope. What are the, the basic truths, the basic fundamentals that cannot change? Those are the things you hold to. And he says, hold to them without wavering or oscillating. And then he gives you the reason why you can hold to them like that. For he who promised is faithful. The thing that keeps you hanging on to Jesus is not that you're so strong. It, it's because he says, I gotcha. Hold on to me, I gotcha. Because what the enemy would do is come running up, frighten you, get you looking at all the stuff around you and saying, I can't do this. This is too much. I'm going to let go. And Jesus says, hold on to me. I got you. 
I, he's faithful. So what do we do? We hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering for he who promises faithful. And here's another one. Third, consider. Consider what? Consider how to stir one another up. Oh, I'm good at that. I remember as a four-year-old child sitting in a chair watching the whole house in an uproar. I'd bit one of my brothers. I stirred up the house. And, and there's still a part of that in me, Lisa would probably say, that I, I just, I, yeah, it happens, right? You, you like to instigate things. You, I don't know, it's like, kind of like, what would happen if I did this? You know, and, and usually that is like something that creates bad things. Um, yeah, I could give you lots of an- examples. Um, just this week I had something blow up almost in my face. I remember cooking a test tube. Well, actually, it was a cigar holder. I was using it as a test tube, filled it up with uh, soda or something, put vinegar in there, put it over the fire for some reason. It blew up in my face. Uh, it, I stirred something up. And in a sense, I think maybe he's saying something like that, only not so negative. Don't stir him up and make him irritated. Don't, you know, throw out you know, who you voted for or whatever, you know, or whether you think masks are a good idea or not. But stir them up. Think about, consider. In other words, take some time and think about how to stir what? How to stir one another up. But not to agitate them, but to stir them up to what? To love and good works. Because you know what? That's what we're called to do. And we need to be a little bit uncomfortable and agitated in those things love and good works and so look how you can consider how you can stir people up to love and good works number four not neglecting to meet together now remember these are all things that are a byproduct of the things that he did for us since we have confidence to enter since we have a great high priest these are the things we do and one of those is to consider how to stir one another up and the fourth one is to not neglect something and what is that to meet together Because what he's actually saying here is this meeting together is a place where the stirring up can happen. If you neglect that, you can begin to drift, and it's not a healthy place for you. And so I'm preaching to the choir, obviously, because you guys are here, and you haven't neglected coming together. But there are those who do and make a practice of this. In fact, the way he says it is interesting, not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some or the practice of some. In other words, some people, you don't show up sometimes because you're sick or, you know, whatever it is, but some people make it a habit not to come, not to be in fellowship. This shouldn't be a duty, but it should, it should be a place that we come and actually enjoy being with each other. We enjoy doing something here that we can't do anywhere else. Here we get to be together when we worship. We get to be together when we hear the word. You get to look me in the face. You get to see my lisp and, the, you know, see when I spit or whatever. And, and, and you get to hug each other and touch each other. There's something beautiful about coming together in fellowship. And, and not only that, this fellowship that we have now, we should recognize how sacred almost this is, how special and how many people in the world don't have this opportunity. And when it's gone, you realize how precious, how incredibly precious it is to be able to gather together. And didn't we feel a little bit of that under COVID when we couldn't come together? Now, some people, I got to confess, my, exam- my observation is some people are like, great, an excuse to stay home, to not go out. And they still haven't stopped hunkering down. They're still hunkered down. But the rest of us began realizing that this is like a death sentence. The effect on people in hospice care and such that were in, in, in sickness, it was debilitating. It was horrible for them to be isolated, the isolation. He says, listen, you guys, for us, this is the opposite of isolation. This is us getting together and challenging each other, being able to do that. And so that's the fifth thing is or fourth thing, don't neglect to meet together as some have the habit of, but contrary to that, do encourage one another. And why do you do that? What's the motivation? All the more as you see the day drawing near. Do you think the day's drawing near? 
Does it seem like times are just getting very confusing, even evil? The things that, the norms that became the baseline from which you could preach the gospel have just shifted in America. But America, of course, sets the pace for the whole world. In the whole world, the times are evil and wicked. And then he goes on from there, but I'm not going to go on from there. I'm going to bless you guys by letting you go early and think about this. And then read through this um, down through verse 31. But keep reading and see how he remedies, how he says what you can do about that. And then we'll talk next week about social shaming and stuff. Um, social shaming may be a little different than we, than we think. And I think all of us are subject to that. Just a quickie on that, you know. Um, it's interesting because we all want to be part of we want people to admire us. And we want to be part of a cool church. A hip church. And we want to invite people, if, even if we're a part of a church that isn't hip and cool, we want to invite people to a hip, cool church. But you know, it could be that part of the social shaming is that we're, we're getting caught up in things that God isn't really that interested in. He's more interested in a group of people that get together and love on each other and know how to do that. And when, we, when I am done talking, lecturing you, and you go get your coffee and wake up and you get a chance to talk to each other, that you keep it going and you encourage each other and you find ways to stir one another up to love and good works. How are we doing on that? How's our report card, I wonder, on that? Because this is a place. This is your opportunity. When you leave here, you might not be in this kind of social contact again for a week. Look around. Look at the people around you. Can we do that? Here, let's just try it. It's super awkward. Just try it. You have to do it every other row or you're looking at the back of people's heads. Look at the people across from you. These are your brothers. These are your sisters. These are people that need encouragement. And honestly, sometimes they're floundering and sometimes they're dying right in front of us. And, and I tell you, it breaks my heart to see hurting people. And, and most of us are a little guarded on letting people know what's going on inside. But you know, part of coming to him with a true heart is honesty before him, but also honesty for, before others. But let's make it a safe place to be honest before others to share the stuff that you got going on. I kid you not, there may be someone right here in our midst today who's thinking about suicide, who's maybe even considered how to make it happen. There's people here who are perhaps considering leaving their spouse. There's people here who are wondering about the authority of God's word in their life or the power of God's word or if this thing is even real. There's people here potentially who are on the outside looking in who've never had start, even started a relationship with Jesus Christ. Maybe even spent their life mocking what this is all about. We don't know, but the Holy Spirit does, and you may be the tool used by the Holy Spirit to speak into their life. So, Father, thank you for the Word of God. Thank you for the power of the Word. And, God, the... the you have done all these things for us, Lord. Thank you that we have this great high priest and the confidence, Lord. Enable us to tap in and move out based on that confidence, not on the shouting voices that would tear us down and tear, tell us we're nobody or tell us we have nothing to offer and that you're not going to be there to support us if we step out in faith. God, we pray that your Holy Spirit would work in our lives, use us, stir us, in Jesus' name. Amen. One of the things that I've seen God do and I've, I've been challenged to do over the years is take what um, Chuck Smith and his, uh, has called uh, ventures of faith. That's where you have a thought because you're going before the Lord, hearing from him and reading his word, and sometimes he stirs something up and you think, what would happen if... 
Or maybe you think, God, I, I'm, my heart's broken over this thing I see. And as you pray about it, God just puts a thought in your mind. And here's what the venture of faith is, is taking the thought and putting it into action. Maybe it doesn't work. Maybe people mock you. Maybe I laugh at you. Maybe everyone else laughs at you. Are we willing to take a risk? Actually, I wouldn't laugh at you. In fact, I would applaud you for just taking a risk. I applaud anyone who's willing to take a risk in following Jesus. But most of us are pretty turtled up, right? We're like, it's safe in here, and it's dangerous to stick my head out and risk beyond this. But I can tell you that we'll die doing that because God never designed us as turtles. He designed us to live in a world around other people. So let's pray about doing that. And let me pray one more time. I want to pray for anyone here that's uh, struggling. I talked about these struggles. Um, those are realities, folks. And, um, and, but God sees you. And, and God would definitely say, that's not something I have for you. I have so much more for you, so much better for you. I have a plan for your life, a plan for good, for a future and hope. And it may not seem pretty right now, and it may seem dark right now, but you, as he will say later in this chapter that maybe I should have gotten to, he said, you have need of endurance. You have need of endurance. And, and it may well be that you're jettisoning, you're, you're getting rid of something that you shouldn't. And you need to hold on to your faith in Jesus Christ. You can get rid of everything else, but hold on to Jesus. And God's got you. God will get you through this. God loves you. Keep your eyes on him. Talk to someone about that. And I want to pray for you and then pray for anyone that maybe um, is just right now, uh, even hasn't come to know Jesus yet. Lord, in Jesus' name, um, I want to come with these this persons uh, that have no relationship with you. Maybe they came in here not even thinking they're interested in it. Or the person who's struggling, Lord, wanting to find the quick escape. Um, God, in Jesus' name, would you put a hand on their shoulder and identify to them how deeply and greatly they're loved by you, Jesus. God, that you're the God of all flesh and nothing, even their circumstance, nothing is too difficult for you. God, you can do all things. And Paul said, I can do all things. Uh, that, that, that is, I can live through these circumstances through Christ who strengthens me. I pray this, Father, in Jesus' name. I don't know why I feel like I just want to keep harping on this. I'm, I just want to say, you know, that there have been times where someone has come to me afterwards and said, what you said was, was from God for me. And, and I do believe that God sees into the heart and sometimes he uses me, not because I know the stuff, but because he knows your stuff and he loves you so much. He doesn't want you to carry that stuff alone. He, he wants you to get it rolled off onto him. He loves you. He loves you incredibly deeply. Every single person here has incredible value to Jesus Christ and for his kingdom. Don't ever let anyone devalue you least of all your own voices. Disagree with those. Hold to the confession of your hope, the confession of your faith. Even say those words of faith because the mouth one conf believe, confesses, with the heart one believes, and with the mouth one confesses, he says, unto righteousness. So God bless you guys. Let's sing a couple worship songs before we go. <laughs>